tonight again we're going to be talking uh, about the gifts of the spirit and tonight we're going to touch on the gift of prophecy uh, we're getting close to the uh, end of this classes and then we can uh, seek the face of the Holy Spirit on uh, what path to chat after that uh, concerning these teachings and uh, and what the Lord wants to bring about. So the gift of prophecy uh, is considered as the courier gift. I call it the courier gift because it's the gift that carries um, all the other revelations. So there's a distinction between the gifts of revelation and prophecy uh, in a general sense. Uh, prophecy in a general sense is a courier or it is a conveyor belt uh, that brings uh, or unloads from heaven and uh, you know translates it uh, to an earthly uh, understanding or to our own earthly perception so um, prophecy is the first of those three gifts of inspiration and it is a simple gift and has often uh, been greatly misunderstood and even today in the body of Christ there's a lot of misconception about what the gift of prophecy is because the term prophecy uh, is used both generally and also specifically so in a general sense it's an inspired utterance uh, but when you talk about prediction and foretelling and all that, then you have to include the other gifts of the Spirit, including the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. Uh, actually, word of wisdom is much more powerful than the gift of prophecy. Because the gift of prophecy without word of knowledge or without word of wisdom will be an empty bucket with nothing to bear. So prophecy needs the other gifts of revelation uh, to be able to facilitate uh, its intentions. So everyone speaking by inspiration might prophesy, right? Uh, but some are spiritually richer in the gift of the Spirit than the others. So you can find people who are prophesying and some people are very, very rich uh, when they get into that gift and they begin to, um, you know, to express the words that are deposited by the Spirit. They are more richer. Their words are more weightier. Their words are more uh, you know, um, built up or their words are more breathed upon. So in the exercise of this gift of prophecy, some of the greater gifts of revelation may be manifested. And that includes the word of knowledge and word of wisdom. So we need to know that when prophecy by itself in a general sense is being used, it's mainly for encouragement, edification, strengthening people, giving hope and, um, and encouragement. Uh, but when revelation is thrown in there, when you find word of wisdom and word of knowledge uh, being packaged together with prophecy, then you know, uh, you know that there is now a revelation. There's now a divine input from heaven. So some people say that the gift of prophecy is nothing more than preaching. And I completely disagree. Uh, because then every preacher out there is prophesying. If this was so, uh, then uh, preparation for preaching would be unnecessary. That would be crazy, you know, that would be an illusion. <laughs> preaching requires preparation. You have to prepare. The Holy Ghost may take your words and breathe upon them and uh, send them in a different direction, but you still have to prepare. The Holy Spirit is able to take a yielded vessel and then speak through their mouth, but there has to be preparation. So for people to say, oh, you know, everybody that's preaching is prophesying, that's a lie because then we don't need, we don't need to prepare then. Just show up next time with no preparation and trust the Holy Ghost to speak through you. You know, there's an element of preparation needed. The Lord Jesus said these words. He said, these words that I speak to you, he didn't say that the words that I prophesy to you, did he? He said, these words that I speak. So there's a distinction between speaking <laughs> and teaching. 
and prophesying. He could have said, these words I prophesy to you, they are full of life, you know. But he said, these words that I speak to you, the, not the word I prophesy unto you, but the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. So there's a necessity for the word of God. So when people uh, replace uh, the preaching of the word of God with, with prophesying, and there's some meetings that I've seen where the whole thing that happens through the whole service is people prophesying left and right. And that is, uh, you know, that is in, not in order. That is not in order according to the word of God, because then uh, we are missing out on the element of God um, speaking to his people through his word. You know, there's a place for prophecy and we're going to see how that fits into the church. So the general term prophecy can cover all those gifts of utterance. It can cover the prophecy, it can cover the word of knowledge, it can cover the word of wisdom, it can cover tongues and interpretation of tongues. So when we're talking about it as a general term, it can include all those things. But the specific gift of prophecy is defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verses 3 and let, let, let's read that he says but he that prophesies speaks not no speaks unto men to what to edification and exhortation and comfort revelation is not mentioned there so that's what I was I was trying to explain that you don't see there that they're mentioning revelation the only thing you see that he that prophesies speaketh unto men for what for edification for exhortation and for comfort so if someone comes to you walks to you and says they have a word of God for you and then they the word that proceeds from their mouth is full of edification is full of exhortation is full of comfort it is not prophesying but it's prophecy in its specific sense it doesn't include any revelation but if somebody prophesies over your life but you find revelation in what they're prophesying there's something that reveals contents of your heart there's something that reveals things that are beyond comprehension to the carnal mind there is something that is revealed that was not known or something that startles people you know, at that moment, you know, a revelation has come through that prophetic gift. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 6 says, What shall I profit to you? I shall speak to you either in revelation or in knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. So we see the diversity when we meet in the church, when we meet for meetings, God wants us to have all these things expressed, not just prophecy, you know, but he's saying, it wants us to be able to do what? To have revelation. It wants us to be able to have what? It wants us to be able to have knowledge, impartation of the word. And he also wants us to be able to have prophecy. But he also wants us to be able to you know, stick to the doctrine of the word of God. So in this verse that we are talking about here, revelation and prophecy are given as separate and distinct from each other. He would have not mentioned them here this way if they were not separate. So we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 6, that um, revelation and prophecy are separate and they're distinct from each other. So that the simple gift of prophecy does not contain revelation. A lot of people think that when you're prophesying, then it's revealed. No, I've had people prophesy scriptures. Does it make them prophecy? I've read people who are prophesying while they're, what they're quoting is basically Psalms. You know, the Lord is your strength, you know. <laughs> or they're quoting Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. You know, he leadeth you in green pastures. That's not prophecy, there's no revelation because that's already a revealed word. So there's no prophecy there, okay. It has to be something that is divine. It has to be something supernatural that is contained within that expression of that gift. So I have also had people who utter under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, um, you know, sensible sequence of words. <laughs> and they have termed it as prophecy. Right? Because prophecy uh, sounds like rhyming or poetic. 
uh, prophecy is a poetic language. In the schools of the prophets in the Bible, prophets were taught how to uh, speak poetically. So that was one of the lessons in the prophetic school in the Old Testament. They had to learn poetry, poetry of words. They had to know how to express themselves in words. And sometimes, you know, I have heard people who use vo vocabulary. All right. You can use vocabularies in sequence and there may be big words. It doesn't make it prophecy just because they're sounding nicely and they're in sequence and they're rhyming doesn't make it prophecy. Even if you add an ec ecstatic spirit on it and you become emotional and you're crying tears, doesn't make it prophecy either. Why? Because there's no revelation in it. Okay. It may be aligning with scripture. And so we can term it as prophecy in a specific sense, but not prophecy with revelation. So this cannot be accepted as evidence of the gift of prophecy since God has already inspired what? The word of God is already inspired. Jesus told us that the words are life. Okay. So we don't need to expect that to be full of life. Why? Because the word is already alive. So if you repeat a passage uh, with a lot of intelligence and with a lot of vocabulary, it's not prophetic either. So it may sound nicely and people may love the sequence of the words and they may get up and jump and scream and say, wow, this guy is really has a way with words. Doesn't make it prophecy. So because prophecy is an inspired utterance, it's fresh, it's pure, and it's from the eternal spiritual source. So it's not just something that came from, you know, hey, I have studied a lot of uh, dictionaries and so I can speak well eloquently and then I arrange words in a way that they will sound like you know God is really speaking something great but it's all proceeding from my natural talents and abilities so how do we define prophecy then prophecy can be defined as the simplest form of inspired utterance the simplest form of inspired utterance it is rhyming, it is poetic, <laughs> the spirit will take the thoughts of God and express them in the language that is raised up above the ordinary expression of the person's natural gift of speech. So you can tell when that person is speaking that the way they are speaking, there is no way. You often you, you know them, you know, maybe they stutter, maybe they stammer. Maybe they never speak smoothly, but when the spirit comes upon them, it's just, they just get eloquent and it's flowing and it's divinely inspired. You know, <laughs> prophecy is greater than the gift of tongues unless tongues is accompanied by the gift of interpretation. So if someone is giving a message in tongues and they don't interpret it, the gift of prophecy is still better than that gift of tongues. Why? Because tongues requires interpretation so that it can edify, so that it can encourage the body. So if people meet together and someone just goes ballistic in tongues and there's no interpretation, it's of no benefit to the body of Christ. Okay? And I've seen situations where someone gave the message in tongues, but there was no interpreter, so everybody left the church they missed something they did not get the message from god because there wasn't anybody to interpret and the one who gave the message did not seek god to give them interpretation so you always want to find out if there is someone in the congregation who can interpret before you go ahead and give the message why because god can choose to give somebody the message but if there's no one uh, to interpret that message we are we are in uh, you know, we're in a, deb a debacle. Why? Because there's nobody to decode that message and be able to give it to the church so that there is, you know, um, edification for the body. So, also, we might regard prophecy as equal to speaking with tongues with interpretation. So, also, someone who gives a message in tongues and then interprets is qualified to be uh, termed as someone who has prophesied. Why? Because God gave him the message in tongues, he spoke it, and then God gave them the interpretation. So the body of Christ heard what God spoke because it was interpreted by the Spirit. So the beauty of that hallowed expression, okay, in prophecy cannot be compared to ordinary speech. So you can tell when people are faking it. 
you can tell when somebody wants attention and they want to grab the microphone and give a word but when you listen to them and what the, the manner in which they're presenting there's no inspiration it's, it's just flesh you know flesh wants to be seen right uh, but when someone is in the spirit when they take that microphone they may start quietly right okay then you present your template of your spirit to god and then god begins to drop things into that template god begins to illuminate things in the spirit and you begin to see pictures flashes of of words you know in front of your face and before you know it you're revealing things contents of hearts that nobody has divulged before why because the spirit is involved in exposing you know, scripture says no man knows the spirit of man except for the spirit of man. You know, and nobody knows the spirit of God except for the spirit of God. And when you fuse the spirit of God and the spirit of man, boom, you have an explosion of supernatural knowledge being expressed through the spirit through a yielded vessel. Then you can tell there's an element of what of knowledge there. There's an element of what of wisdom. Definitely God has spoken to me. Why? Because there's no way that person could have known that. But we have to also be careful because diviners can do the same, same thing, right? Diviners and familiar spirits and seducing spirits and python spirit can also do that. Divination spirit can do that. Sorcerers and wizards and mediums can also do that. So we cannot say anybody that is telling people's futures or people's past or anybody that can uh, you know, tell about your life is flowing from God. No. Who is the source of the spirit in them? Is the source the Holy Spirit of God or is this a different spirit? Jesus said you will know them by their fruits. He didn't say you'll know their mind by their fruits. No, there's a distinction there. If you want to know they are his, he says you will know how they love one another. You'll know their mind by their love that they express to one another. But if you want to know them separately from me, watch their fruits. Okay, so you can't have the fruit of God and mix it with the fruit of devil. It doesn't make sense. There's not going to be, uh, there's not going to be, a, a, you know, a salty water flowing from a fresh river. It's never going to happen. You know, so we need to be discerning so that we can tell what is the source of the message. Is it a soulish message? Because the soul can express good things, right? There's a good nature. In men and that good nature in men can even proceed from the old nature the old nature can speak nice things based on your foundational upbringing based on what was planted in you as you grow up in your family you know and that can be deceptive because it can play in you know the human spirit okay that is the human spirit that is not completely yielded can be soiled by the soul or by the natural man and natural good words can flow from people's mouth and it can be perceived as from the spirit yet not from the spirit so we have to know when it's the spirit you will know when it's not the spirit you your spirit will set you know wrestling with with that word your spirit will go back and forth your spirit will be doing somersaults uh, your spirit will be flipping up and down why because something is not just right somewhere so how how do we use prophecy prophecy was used um, in the book of lamentation right Remember Jeremiah? Jeremiah used a lot of lamentation. You know, remember Jeremiah was a witness to the siege of the city of Jerusalem that began in uh, the five, uh, 589 BC and concluded with the destruction in 586 BC. And he had to deal with the unfaithfulness of God's people. And not just God's people, but it was unfaithfulness of everybody from the kings, the princesses, the priests, and the prophets. They were all unfaithful to God. You know, and they still came to the temple. Does that sound like today? They were all unfaithful. They were doing all kind of wrong things, but they were still coming to the temple and offering their sacrifices. They were still coming to the temple and offering their money. They were still coming to the temple and lifting their hands up to God, even though God says, you know, lift holy hands unto me, not filthy hands. But people were still coming and lifting hands and offering sacrifices and calling the name of the Lord. But they failed to acknowledge the rulership of God in their lives. There was no God in their lives. There was no expression. There was no identity. There was no signature of God in their lives. And Jeremiah had to lament against them. So when you're in a prophetic ministry, you'll find yourself sometimes lamenting against the sins of the people. 
What did you understand that when you're a prophet or you're moving in the gift of prophecy, God will take the burdens of his heart and upload them upon you? That's why prophets are weepy people, you know, or crying people, wailing people. Why? Because there's always something that grieves his heart. And when that happens, God finds people that he can express himself through. If people who feel what he feels, people who, 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 people who tarry with him for an hour, people who spend time with him to sense what he's sensing and feel what he's feeling. And prophetic people are yielded. Intercessors and prophets are people that God can trust to, to cry with him, you know, to sense the burdens of his heart. So Jeremiah was lamenting in Jeremiah chapter 7 from verses 1 to 11. Prophecy was also used in the song of Moses when they crossed the Red Sea. There's at least uh, three songs that Moses wrote, uh, but the one that was sung at the, uh, at the Red Sea is important in Exodus chapter 15. Okay. Another one is recorded in Psalms 90 and the other one was written in the last days of Moses' life in Deuteronomy 32. And we can see on that song after they crossed the Red Sea is using uh, lamentation or is using a song as a prophetic uh, you know, instrument to express gratefulness of what God has done. Uh, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies. For I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Okay. Isaiah 12. We also see Isaiah using similar words. The Lord is my strength and my song. These are, pro these are prophetic words used in songs. The prayer of Habakkuk. Also in Habakkuk chapter 3 from verses 1 to 16. Is another type of uh, prophetic uh, you know expression so this type of uh, prayer differs from the nominal or the normal prayers that we are used to because this prayer is under the what is under the unction of the spirit and it does not originate in the mind you know of the speaker you know this prayer is proceeding from your heart and I think it's a high time the church learns how to pray from the spiritual point where you wait to express words that are flowing from your spirit once it starts dripping like a tap or like a faucet and it keeps dripping and dripping, it doesn't stop. It just flows out of you in, and it's just measure after measure after measure. Why? Because you are yielding that template to the spirit so that he can be able to speak with you. Prophecy is anointed speaking. And that's another way of defining prophecy. Prophecy is anointed speaking. You can speak naturally. But when your speaking is anointed, it could be prophecy because then it will have the element of revelation in it. So the Spirit gives utterance. You don't initiate utterance. Even at Pentecost, nobody initiated utterance. He says, and this, the, the Holy Spirit came upon them and he gave them utterance and they began to speak in other tongues. Today in the church, we are teaching people how to speak in their natural dialects and we are telling them to repeat ma 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 ba 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 it's like the sheep thing you know the sheep go ba so somebody comes to you and says just do ba and repeat it and then you have a bunch of people going ba 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 ma 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 you know because somebody told them to repeat a bunch of words it it is the spirit that gives utterance so when you're being with, when you're receiving the holy spirit the spirit must give utterance. It must breathe upon the word. You can't initiate anything. So when co someone comes and tells you, oh, just repeat, you know, mama, mu, mama, du, ka, 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 ba, 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 cha, 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 te, 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 bu, 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 bu. This is ridiculous. Then people start saying shaka boomba. Where is that coming from? <laughs> you can't you can't initiate it god has to produce it there has to be an utterance okay it has to be breathed upon god has to breathe upon it it's an anointed speech okay spirit gives utterance you know the poetic gift is also the expression of natural talent and it requires thought 
it requires imagination it requires composition and it's all it's always improved on you know anybody who writes poem you have to improve on it you come up with a draft piece and then you go over the draft and then you add some words there okay it needs to be also written in rhyme so that requires you thinking of a rhyming words okay but when it comes to the spiritual eloquence you have no time to plot you have no time to scheme they have no time to think it's the holy spirit in a moment speaking through you and people hearing words that they don't always hear you speak why because god is invading your speech and breathing upon it and expressing himself so people could hear you and go like wow you know that's not you could watch some of your messages and go like well that wasn't me something happened at this point so prophecy does not spring from the natural talent he doesn't even spring from personality so anyone who is not at all poetically inclined by nature can under the unction of the holy spirit be prophetic and move in the spirit that's why paul was saying all can prophesy right that's it meant every single person you don't have to be prophetic to prophesy you every single person can prophesy and i can give you an example let's look at first samuel chapter 19 verses 24. Uh, this is saul saul coming near the company of the prophets and you know if you go near the prophet if you go to the territory where the calling is higher than you you may do crazy things if that anointing comes upon you and you're not strong enough you may wind up doing what saul did here he stripped off his clothes the guy went naked and he prophesied before samuel in a like manner huh people will be running and covering their eyes and getting blankets to cover you and he lay down naked all day and all night <laughs> so i believe that there's a message here that there's some there's some callings that are not meant for everybody <laughs> He walked into a territory and when that anointing came upon him, it made him do stupid things. Mm. Don't make a fool out of yourself. <laughs> huh? Yeah, they will pink clip here, right? So they, they, it wasn't intended to go to this territory, but it tells you that the spirit of prophecy can jump on anybody. And if you're not strong enough, you could turn into a madman, just like Saul is now a madman laying there naked, you know, probably doesn't know what's really happening to him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 6, we see the same, same thing. Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, rush upon you, I like the term. The Spirit of, the Spirit of God will rush upon you and you'll prophesy with them and you'll be transformed into a different person. That means that when that Spirit is upon you, you're no longer yourself. Now, let's give distinction of the prophecy that we see today. Because I will tell you this, some of the prophecies that we see today in the church is not the one where the Spirit takes over you and you're turned into somebody else. Because most people are still themselves when they prophesy. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you and He has taken over your speech, people can tell. You know, people can tell there's, there's a change. Your emotions change. You know, you begin to be sensitive to what the Spirit of God wants. You know, it's like you're laser focused upon what the Spirit of God wants. So you're turned into a person. In the normal, real sense, people don't see you like that. But when you're in that anointing, they can tell something is different. Something is different on that person today. Why? Because the Spirit just transformed you into a different person and you're no longer yourself. And I think it's beautiful because it's no longer you now in full control, but the Spirit has access to the vessel and he can express himself as he desires. And when the Spirit is done, he backs away. So then the prophet is within limit to control himself. You know, otherwise you wind up in the flesh and then you start exaggerating. First Corinthians 14, 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an, an uninformed person comes in, is convinced by all and is convicted by all. If all prophesy and an unbeliever 
or an uninformed person comes into the church he is convinced by all and is convicted by all so this gift of prophecy will make the unconverted man conscious of the presence of God and through the prophetic utterance they may come to a place of repentance God may give them some revelation of themselves or their condition that may lead them to a place of repentance or a place of conviction okay so that is where prophecy taps into the gift of revelation so if you're gifted prophetic prophetically ask God to also give you the gift of wisdom and the gift of a word of knowledge so that you're able to bring more revelation into uh, the template of your soul so that you can express it so we read in verses 29 let the prophets pick two or three and let them let the other ones judge let one prophesy and let the other ones judge so paul gives us the order of operating in a prophetic he says that the three people can prophesy at the same same time one can prophesy the other one can listen or the other ones can judge one one is prophesying the other ones are listening and judging why is that judging necessary because they are there to discern okay and this is not the gift of discernment you know the gift of discernment that doesn't, doesn't apply to that they are there to judge using scripture using knowledge in the word of god they're willing to judge to see what what's being said is it lining up with the redemptive nature of the gospel and is it grounded in the doctrine of the apostles is it grounded on what christ taught you know is it edifying is it inspiring is it you know provoking that person into the depths of god you know so they're judging to make sure that it's right and then you know when they're done judging then they may take turns and another one may shoot up and start prophesying and the other one will listen and judge. Paul gave an order of how this should be done. Sadly, today in the church, there's not a lot of organization. It's just anything goes. So this simple gift of prophecy should be coveted. You know, as in verse of this chapter we read, follow after what? Paul says what? Follow after charity and desire the spiritual gifts but rather that you may prophesy he says rather that you may prophesy because when you're prophesying over people you're going to bring hope you're going to bring hope in the hopelessness you're going to be able to encourage people you're going to be able to strengthen people but you're going to be able to also bring revelation and god's wisdom god's general wisdom concerning a situation does it mean if you're prophesying you're a prophet we just proved earlier that saul went near where the prophets were gathering or he went around the school of the prophets and the spirit hit him hard and he fell on the ground and he was there naked right so he was just another person he wasn't a prophet but he went around the prophets and some of that anointing smeared on him and he was able to prophesy so the office of a prophet will include the gift of prophecy and if someone is a prophet they will possess the gift of prophecy also but they will also have the gift of word of wisdom and word of knowledge just because someone is prophesying doesn't make them a prophet unless there is revelation in their expression okay so what shows you that people are growing in their prophetic ministry is when you begin to see revelation drop into their prophecy. When you begin to detect word of wisdom, word of knowledge, when you begin to detect divinely inspired things in their speech, then you know the prophetic ministry is being forged through the fire. It's being built up in that person. But just because someone is going around prophesying doesn't make them a prophet. And there's a lot of people in the body of Christ today who assume that as a man thinketh so is he so you wake up in the morning and you think you're a prophet and you label yourself one and now you think okay i can register my five for one three c and go around telling people hopeless words deceiving yourself you are <laughs> amen there has to be an element of revelation in there a wealthy man has money isn't it but there are many people who have money but it doesn't make them wealthy does it uh, let's repeat that again 
A wealthy man has a lot of money. But there's a lot of people who have money here in America, but they're not wealthy. So having money doesn't make you wealthy or rich. The same is with the spiritual things. Just because you're prophesying doesn't make you a prophet. Every prophet will have that simple gift of prophesy, prophesying in a specific sense. Okay? But there are many who have that simple gift and it does not make them prophet. So the gift of the Spirit are for what? What was the role of the gift of the Spirit that we talked about last time? The, the role of the gift of the Spirit is to apprehend people's attention. How did that guy know about my stuff? How did that guy find out about that issue? That's a deep issue. That is something that nobody else knows. So now they have your attention. Now the prophet has your attention because now you're more open to receive the message. And let me tell you, that is the same, same tactic divine has used. That is the same, same tactic that false preachers use. When someone tells you that they have a prophetic word for you, but um, they will give you one today and they will wait uh, a few months to give you the other one. That is manipulation and control and witchcraft. Because if you have full word for somebody, give them. <laughs> Unless they're not prepared for the word, then you can say, hey, I don't sense that this, you're ready for what God is saying right now. So I'll pray for preparation and readiness until when you're ready. Okay. But the diviners, on the other hand, they will give one word to you so that you can give them an offering and then they will use that offering as a permission now now that they have access to your soul and they have told you what you want it's like psychics they tell you what you want to hear and once you hear it you're like i'll go back there and hear every other thing that i want to know so you, you go to a false prophet over and over again so that they can tell you stuff that the holy spirit should be telling you jesus said the sheep hears my voice he didn't say that we are supposed to be depending on prophets to re regurgitate words every time and tell us. We need to e examine or circumcise our ears so that we are able to perceive. Then, when someone comes to prophesy, it's a confirmation. God has been speaking to me. You're confirming what God is saying. Now I know I'm speaking prophetically. Why? Because it's a confirmation. It's nothing new under the sun. But this is what diviners do. They will use that opportunity to open you up. Now they have your attention. Now you want to go back and hear another word. And before you know it, you have turned a man into the Holy Spirit. You have turned a man into a source of information instead of the Holy Spirit. What happened to the fellowship of the Holy Spirit? What happened to the promise of Jesus when he said the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will teach you all things and he will lead you in all manner of things. What happened to that? You know, but, but this is the deceptive spirit that has entered into the body of Christ. Everybody running everywhere looking for words. The first place to look for the word of God is in a scripture. Secondly, you can ask the Holy Spirit to show you something new and he will. And I always put that demand on that scripture. It says here that when you come, you'll reveal to us everything as pertaining to life. And you'll reveal things which are to come. So I put this demand upon you, Holy Spirit. I, I, I ask you to do what you have already authored in your word. Reveal to me what is yet to come. Now, if God feels like you're the instrument to carry that message, he will give it to you. But if he has already assigned somebody else in the body of Christ to carry that message, he won't because it's not yours. Not everybody carries messages. God chooses who he gives message. He chooses who he gives this message to. He chooses who he gives the other message to. Why? Because if he's a one-man show, he doesn't glorify Christ. He wants the whole body of Christ to be edified. Okay? So sometimes God will withhold revelations and words from some people and give them to some because he's a God of the body. He's not a God of superstars. He's not a God of one person. He wants to display his power within the context of the body because the body carries the habitation of God through the person of the Holy Spirit. So the gifts of the Spirit can capture people's attention. But salvation takes place by preaching the Word of God. <laughs> because you need conviction. For someone to come to the Lord, you don't need prophecy. Unless prophecy has revelation. And the revelation leads to 
repentance. But before even repentance comes, you will still have to preach the word. So you see the combination of how this work is that you will walk to someone and God will open up a prophetic gift to bring divine wisdom or divine knowledge of God as pertaining, as pertaining to a situation in that person's life. That person will be startled, they will be shocked. And then in that moment, the spirit of preaching the word may come forth so that then you preach the word concerning what was just revealed. It leads to conviction, which ultimately leads to salvation. So we cannot take prophecy and say, no, we don't need teaching. I'll just use prophecy to get people saved. No, prophecy can show them the contents of their heart and that could lead them to want to repent and forsake their sins. And then the word of God comes in. How can they believe without the preaching of the word? That's what the word says. How can they believe without a preacher? How can they believe without the preacher preaching a word? Not prophesying. It didn't say prophesying. So people nowadays take one element of this gift and they brand it and they forsake all the other implementations of the gift. And no wonder we have so much confusion when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit. So you could be convicted by a prophet utterance that may lead to the preaching of the word and ultimately salvation of your soul. The gifts of God are given for signs and wonders to do what? To arrest people. So God used what? The burning bush to arrest Moses' attention. So Moses was mesmerized in that moment because this bush was burning out of nowhere. It was being it was burning without being consumed. And and when he when he, he turned around to look at it, then God spoke. God got his attention. So God can use the gifts of the Spirit to get your attention. But there's a difference between the office of a prophet and that simple gift of prophecy. The office is greater than the gift. There is a great difference between a prophet's office and that gift of prophecy. So let's talk a little bit about a prophet. So a prophet is the one who has the gift of revelations, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, or the discerning of the spirit. Most people who are working in the prophetic ministry will have a combination of all those three. Why? Because God needs them in the prophetic office to be able to correct things, detect things, uproot things, destroy things. And also, prophets tend to have the gift of faith also because they will be forced to oppose different opinions and deal with the difficult circumstances that require survival or that requires their life will be at stake, okay? That will require their head to be on the chop block. It may require them to be arrested or to be persecuted. So God will give them the gift of faith so that they can stand the persecution, so that they can resist. The, uh, you know, there's always an easy way out you know, to quit. We talked about Elijah last time, how Elijah quickly, coming from a victorious place of slaying all the prophets of Baal, and he finds himself running from Jezebel. Even though Jezebel was a skinny woman who was, you know, not uh, a challenge to him. Uh, you know, Elijah took off running. Why? Because Jezebel said, I'm going to do with you exactly what you've done with the false prophet. And fear came upon him and he took off running. So we can see that it's very easy sometimes for people in the prophetic ministry to be vulnerable. And you will need faith to be able to stand against the impossible things. So in the simple gift of prophecy... There's no revelation. There's, there's inspiration in that utterance, but there's no revelation. If someone is a prophet, then they're using that simple gift as a conveyor or as a courier that carries the grace of God and pours forth. So it's possible that one, um, that one, uh, one or more, those more gifts of revelation could be functioning in conjunction with a uh, prophetic gift if someone is in a prophetic office. You know, so if someone is a prophet, there will be revelation and there will be also, a, it will be conveyed by preaching and prophesying sometimes. So the prophet may give his revelations by repeating them in an ordinary conversation or by prophesying, uh, you know, them under the unctions of the spirit. And I've had situations where I'm speaking to someone, but unbeknownst to me, the words that I'm speaking are actually prophecy. And they're being revealed. They are things that the Holy Spirit is revealing. My tongue is yielded in that moment.
to the spirit so the spirit is using it to express himself so the person may be listening to you and within two or three minutes they break down and they're crying and when you ask them what's going on is this thing that you say it's, it's always is this thing that you say here that means that what they're saying that thing that you say did not originate they didn't expect it it was unbeknown to you so the spirit is beginning and sometimes it happens without even you being aware it depends on the level of yieldedness and the level of surrender the holy spirit will just begin to speak through you and you open your mouth and you start rumbling and before you know it you're speaking mysteries in the spirit a prophet will generally be a preacher and a teacher except that what he will have a greater authority you know in his office that will flow from that office when it comes to revelation or when it comes to expounding the word of god you know so if a person who does not possess any of the gifts of revelation was to prophesy and a genuine revelation came forth uh, from that prophecy it will prove that he has received it from god and that you know um at that time he was exercising the simple gift of prophecy but then god chose to drop that revelation in there it may also be a sign that god will do it again that means that there is a potential in him to grow into the prophetic office so and that is the same same thing you know um with someone who is exercising um you know is the same way if a person uh, has never exercised the gift of healing and they might find themselves being used by god on some specific occasion uh, to bring forth the gift of healing or to lay hands on someone to be healed it doesn't mean that god has given them the gift of healing it just means that in that moment they were yielded enough as an instrument and god expressed himself through them right um the best gift out of the gifts of revelation is the word of wisdom right many people run to prophecy but word of wisdom is the greatest okay and many people think that this is natural wisdom so they think that if i've gone to school and i have a lot of knowledge and a lot of education uh educational knowledge you know <laughs> head knowledge could lead to shrunken soul you could have a head full of knowledge a head packed by knowledge but a soul that is malnourished and shrunken in the spirit so head knowledge does not validate or it doesn't authenticate someone as having the gift of wisdom so the best gift out of the gifts of revelation is the word of wisdom the word of wisdom gives what it gives revelation of the divine mind of god that's why it is important because if our prophecy does not include the divine mind of god we are in serious trouble because everything that we are saying should not have a thus says the lord on it now, and that says the Lord must be the mind of God bestowed upon a vessel and that vessel must be certain that God has spoken it's not it's not what I feel you know it's I know for you to say and that says you must know realize the spirit of God knows everything that is in the mind of God and we have the spirit of God living in us what a beauty you have the spirit of God living in you and the spirit of God can fathom the mind of God and your spirit is in unity with the spirit of God what an opportunity of divine expression right there that's the perfect recipe for us to receive uh, news from heaven and be able to dis disperse it on this earth as God gives us the grace in 1 Corinthians 14 5 says this greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks in tongues except he can interpret and the one that prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues but if the one take talking in tongues does not know how to interpret then his gift is termed as not necessary or is a nuisance why because then nobody gets edified nobody will be able to receive what you just spoke and be able to be built by it and remember at this point many people may say oh well but people speak in tongues all the time no we have to distinctly understand the three different type of tongues because there's tongues for prayer you know that is the language of the angels that's what paul says when i pray in tongues 
my no no man can hear me because I speak I speak mysteries in the spirit. So that is tongue as a prayer language. Then we have tongue as prophecy. Okay, that's what Paul is talking about. He that speaks in tongues must also pray that he interprets. That is tongues as a prophecy that must be interpreted. And then we also have tongues to speak in diversity of languages. Where you can go to China and you're still speaking in tongues, but immediately God takes your turn, tongues and changes. Or there's a miracle that takes place in your tongues and your tongues change and you begin to speak in diversity of languages. And the hearers that are hearing you will be able to hear you clearly, plainly in their natural exotic languages. That is a, a good example of tongue as a diversity of languages. We have tongue as a language of prayer, and then we have tongue as a prophetic instrument for God to speak and for the people who are able to interpret, to interpret it. So there should not, should not be any confusion about these three tongues of expression and the difference between the prophetic uh, tongue as we are, uh, or the gift of tongues as we are talking about. Now, the gift of tongues also manifested on the day of Pentecost because inside the upper room they were already filled with the Spirit and they were speaking in tongues. That was the prayer language. It was already inside the upper room the prayer language was already taking place. But when they came outside and they began to now speak in a new language, that language was different because we're told they heard them in their own languages. There's a contradiction right there because Paul says, you speaks in tongues, no man can hear him save you know, he's speaking in his spirit, he's speaking mysteries. So that can't be the same, same tongue because people heard them in their own native languages. And there were Jewish people from all over the world and they heard them in their own native languages. So that means that when they stepped out, they came from the prayer language to God changing their prayer language and manifesting the gift of diversity of tongues. And they spoke in different languages. There's a distinction, there's a difference. Many people don't want to teach it this way, but this is the reality. There's one tongue, God can choose your tongue, and He can change it in a moment and give a prophetic word and someone will have to interpret it. The source, the essence, spring forth from tongues as a prayer language. That's a vehicle that God can use to manifest diversity of tongues. And He can also use it to speak forth a prophecy with revelation and require somebody in the body to interpret it. 1 Corinthians 14.5 Greater is he that prophesies and he that speaks in tongues except he can interpret. Because the one who prophesies, what does he do? He edifies the body. The one who speaks in other tongues without interpretation he is not edifying others. Paul says this, let such a person speak to himself and God. He's basically saying, shut up. <laughs> zip it you know he says that kind of a person should be quiet and speak between himself and God why because nobody can hear him unless he can interpret it so if an interpretation is given after the speaking with tongues then we will say that that is actually equivalent to what to prophecy that has been given so how do you know that you possess the gift of prophecy because the words that come to you in a moment, okay, the words that will come to you in a moment will be like a stirring stream. It will be like a bubbling brook. The stirring of the spirit, the urge from the spirit that will make you so uncomfortable, okay, and it will compel you to speak or to produce utterance you will have an inward witness that is unshakable. You'll find yourself getting up from your chair, even if you're unwilling to get up. You'll find yourself getting up. It's like something is pushing you and your legs are being pushed. Go. You'll feel like your heart is pounding and there is something drawing you, whether you want to sit there or not. That is a sign that God has given you a word that is immediate. It's urgent. It must be spoken. The words may come to you in a moment and they may appear as inspired utterance. So prophecy is speaking under the anointing of the Spirit. And when the anointing ceases, 
then the person shall cease to do what? To prophesy. Because if they don't, they're in the flesh immediately. So when you're speaking in other tongues, there's evidence in your tongues that God has influenced the temple. All right? That is how you know God has influenced the temple. How do you know it? God has taken possession of your tongue. God has taken possession of your mental faculties. God has taken your emotional area. He's using your emotions to weep for the sins of men. God has taken over your will and you're longer doing your will, but you're doing the will of God. God can take those instrumentation of your personality, those three areas of expression of who you are, those three areas of personality. God can take them and possess them. And if he has full possession over those areas, and when I'm talking about possession here, I'm not talking about possession in a wrong way. I'm talking about God coming, you know, taking control of your mental ability to perceive and then he's able to plant knowledge, plant wisdom, plant revelation into your spirit. And then in cooperation with your soul, you speak forth in obedience and you see mighty things unfold. Okay, so we have spirit in the speech or spirit in the expression of man or woman of God. Then you will know that the spirit has invaded that temple and God is in control. So when Moses erected the tabernacle in the wilderness, what happened? God entered that tabernacle. When we erect our temples, and I want to say this, when you erect your temple, Moses first of all had to erect the temple. And it was a process. God directed him on how to erect that temple. And everything that God told him, it did to the details of everything that God commanded. And it came to a point where the erecting was so precise that God had no alternative but to enter it. If we build correctly, God will have no alternative but to possess the vessel and use the vessel for his own purposes.